Back when I was at St. Bonaventure University, a friend of mine had a beat-up station wagon, and about once a month, we'd make a run into Salamanca, a town inside the Seneca tribal nation. Now, he liked the first people cigarette prices, and I liked the Cokes in a glass bottle for 50 cents. A very old man with skin like aged leather seemed to live behind the counter of the smoke shop. In an oversized drab t-shirt, oil-stained jeans, and a walked-out pair of construction boots, he could never be hurried. But he was also never bothered when my friend asked politely for two cartons of Newports. He had seen time pass, and he was in no hurry to make it fly. He looked straight at you when you checked out, or maybe straight through you, but he never said a word. Now, we were there one day in the fall of 89, me grabbing two glass bottle Cokes and my friend getting two cartons of Newports, and this guy from Cheektowaga or Hamburg or some other part of Buffalo walked in. You could tell. He wore a Bills jersey, number 78, Bruce Smith, and a Bills hat. Now, why he was dressed like that, I don't know, because it wasn't a Sunday. This guy walked into this Seneca Nation smoke shop dressed like he was going to a tailgate at Rich Stadium. I mean, that's what the old stadium was before Highmark. And he stomped over to the beer cooler. He pulled out two cases of Genesee beer, lumbered back towards the counter where my friend was still waiting to get his cigarettes, and pushed my friend aside so he could put the cases on the counter. He then turned around found the chip rack, and grabbed a box of Snyder's pretzels and a bag of sour cream and onion ruffles. Again, he marched back to the counter, shouldered my friend aside, who was still waiting for the man in the drab t-shirt to pull two cartons of Newports, and he said, that's it. So for about 20 seconds, the smoke shop was silent as the man in the drab t-shirt slid two cartons out from the feeder. Back at the soda cooler, I could hear the cartons slide against each other and drop down. And he turned back to the counter, cartons in hand, and put them down. The old man then looked at my friend, then looked down at the old school manual register and poked in the prices. Now, when you hear this story in 2024, maybe you can't even imagine this sort of machine that wasn't electric, but powered by the punching of keys. It was entirely part of the experience of buying two Cokes in Salamanca. The man in the drab t-shirt's fingertips were probably hard enough to poke a hole through the chassis of a 67 El Camino from punching the keys of that register day after day, year after year. When he punched the keys, he made a tally of your purchase but he punched them as if that tally would never be forgotten. When he finished poking in the price of the Newport cigarettes at the First Nation prices, he looked straight at my friend and he said, $8.20 for your regular. The guy in the Bills jersey snuffed as if the size of his two cases should have cut him in line ahead of the Newports, but the man in the drab t-shirt didn't seem to pay attention. My friend gave him two fives, and the old man, not wanting to make time fly, stacked them in his hand so they faced the same way, tendered the $10 into the manual register as if he was accounting for the deeds of all men, and rang the sale to a rather oversized ka-ching to open the drawer for change. Slowly he flipped up the clips in the five and one dollar bill slots, placed the fives in their new home, drew out a dollar bill which seemed to be as old as he was, and then began to count out 80 cents pulling out one coin at a time. He nested the coins in the dollar bill, looked straight at my friend, handed him the change, and said, buck 80 and thank you. He looked over my friend's shoulder at me, straight across the shop. It was the first time he'd ever looked at me when I wasn't standing right in front of him, and he said in a normal tone of voice, you got your Cokes yet? It wasn't a question felt a little bit like he was telling me I was next in line. I looked over at him and I said, I I think that guy, and I meant the guy in the Bills jersey, right? He's next. I'm okay. The man in the drab shirt looked at me, and while I don't think his face moved, I felt like he frowned a little at me. It was all in his eyes. And then he did something I had never seen him do. He did not look at the customer at the counter. He just started ringing him up, one keystroke at a time, not chasing after time so it wouldn't fly. Poke, poke, poke at the manual register for the first case of beer. Poke, poke, poke for the
the second case of beer. Poke, poke, poke for the box of pretzels. Poke, poke, poke for the bag of chips. When he was finished, he looked at the guy in the Bills jersey and he paused. And then he shook his head a little, very sadly, and drew in a deep breath. Bills fan, he said to the guy who just wanted to pay for his beer. The Bills fan snorted again and gave a broad shrug. Arms opened up as if to say, you think? But he didn't actually say the words. The old man in the drab shirt drew in another breath, looking at the other fellow in red, white, and blue. And he began to speak. I recognized his voice, but it was different now. It seemed to fill the smoke shop as if it was a cave or a catacomb of ancient truth. And he was reciting something he'd known for a very long time. A long time ago, when the first people were chased from the land, once called Hodenoseni, three dying elders shed a tear on the shore of the lake called Ariel Hodan, the long tail as a curse against the white men who stole their land. With their last breath, they whispered in unison, Chiquata, Chaco, Chenhavu, Hachizom Bohiwakni, Mibiya, Yapibusoro. The smoke shop was silent as he finished the last words. They hung in the air as if all of time, waiting for that moment, would not move until he was finished with the tally of the things long past. The guy in the Bills jersey was stunned out of his hurry for a moment and asked the man in the drab shirt, what, what does it mean? And the old man sighed. He looked at me. He looked at my friend with the cigarettes. And then he looked back at the guy in the Bills jersey. His eyes were wet with sorrow and, I think, a little anger. He raised his voice only enough to make his point, and he said, roughly translated, it means your football team will never win the Super Bowl. And I tell you that story only to say this, you will always be disappointed by the Bills' performance. It's a tribal curse over western New York.